This discussion is going to look at cardiovascular conditions and disorders and look at ways that exercise can be implemented uh, to assist these individuals. So looking at cardiovascular disorders in general, so just a couple background points. Again, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death in the United States, um, and atherosclerosis, uh, or the development of plaques, is kind of the underlying cause. So that's going to be the most common thing that you're going to see as individuals who've been diagnosed with this. So again, trying to find different ways to, to kind of assist them. There's there's two different risk factor categories. So you have your modifiable risk factors as it relates to cardiovascular uh, disease. So again, for the, for the development of cardiovascular disease, your modifiable risk factors include things like hypertension, which we're going to be talking about, as well as a separate condition. Um, the lip, their lipid profiles. Uh, so we talked about dyslipidemia in the in the previous chapter. Exercise history, smoking diabetes, sedentary behavior are all modifiable risk factors. Your, your non-modifiable risk factors, again, obviously we're looking at individuals who tend to have a greater chance of developing cardiovascular disease. You look at age, you look at gender, you look at family history, those would be your, your non-modifiable risk factors. So looking at our conditions, we start with hypertension. So hypertension is systolic blood pressure of 140 or higher and a diastolic of 90 or higher or both confirmed on at least two separate occasions. Okay, so it's not one time somebody's blood pressure is a little elevated, they get diagnosed with this. It has to be on at least two separate occasions. Now, a couple things to note, and we talked about this previously, previously in the assessment chapter. So again, Normal blood pressure when you're taking it should be, it should be, uh, your systolic should be below 120 and your diastolic should be below 80. You also have what's called prehypertension, which is a systolic of 120 to 139 um, or a diastolic between 80 and 89. And then you have obviously here, this would be classified as stage one hypertension with the numbers I just gave. And then your stage two hypertension would be a systolic of greater than or equal to 160 uh, or a diastolic of uh, greater than or equal to 100. So those are kind of your different levels. So that's what you'd be, be kind of monitoring the per person for. Um, and again, prehypertension is something that you, you kind of want to look at early to see um, is somebody starting to, to develop um, would someone be at risk for developing hypertension? So again, what you're, what you're looking at is your, your two determinants of blood pressure are cardiac output and peripheral resistance. So if you think about what blood pressure is, so again, it's important to kind of know. So we obviously know how to take blood pressure, the numbers, like what does it mean? So we have to have blood pressure because blood pressure is kind of what allows oxygen to kind of perfuse through our vessels to be able to get that. So it's the, it's literally the pressure of the blood up against uh, the, the walls of the blood vessels. Um, when you have elevated cardiac output or total peripheral resistance, or both for that matter, um, there's also other things that could possibly contribute to, to hypertension, um, excessive salt intake, salt sensitivity, chronic kidney disease, uh, and kidney dysfunction will all contribute to hypertension as well. 90 to 95% of the cases of hypertension is what's called primary hypertension or basically hypertension with no known cause. Um, secondary hypertension is when you have um, a known cause. So in other words, for instance, a medical condition, for instance, like kidney dysfunction, that would, that would cause the hypertension. That would be your secondary hypertension. Um, it's important to know that hypertension, they also, and your, your book talks about this, it's called the silent killer. And, and the reason being is that there, there's really many times a lack of symptoms. So in other words, many times individuals, you know, if they're not, you know, getting regular well visits with their physician or they're not checking their blood pressure, they may have high blood pressure and not even know it. And in the meantime, again, there, there could be, you know, issues happening um, in the cardiovascular system or in other parts of their body that, that could be getting damaged because of this. They kind of call it the silent killer for that reason. 
So I'm looking at many of the medications. So before we even get into the medications, first know that one of the first things that look to do even before medications are prescribed is you, you look to um, deal with lifestyle changes first. So consider diet changes, consider adding exercise, you know, look at some of the different lifestyle things that could be changed first before you do medication. And if medication becomes what you would look to do first, first you would look at, at diuretics, okay? So, you know, diuretics decrease blood volume. So that's basically the way. So one of the ways when you're looking at medications, again, I always tell you guys, look at the way they're classified, look at the common mechanisms that they that they treat. So diuretics look to decrease fluid load. So they basically cause the body to expel fluid, which is gonna decrease your blood volume. So you figure if there's less blood volume, that's gonna decrease your, your, your pressure in your system. So your diuretics um, would look to do that. Beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and angiotensin II re receptor blockers, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, these affect blood vessel tone. So we also said that, you know, peripheral resistance obviously also increases pressure. If there's more tone, if, if there's more um, resistance in the vessels, that's also going to increase pressure, so blood pressure. So these all look to basically reduce blood pressure through affecting blood vessel tone. So more or less, they relax the blood vessels and allowing for a, a decrease in blood pressure to take place. Um, it's important to note that Individuals many times could be on multiple medications, so make sure to understand the side effects of these. So obviously there's gonna be, when we look at exercise, you know, obviously the importance of the cardiovascular system and being able to, to maintain exercise. When we're looking at what's gonna happen with um, certain things, so for instance, I'm giving the example here of how beta blockers uh, actually decrease heart rate as well, and then thereby, obviously, they're going to affect how the exercise intensity could be measured. So again, we have to look at all of the different things that would, would occur as a result of the medication. So again, you know, look at the, look at the classifications, you know, again, look at your medication table at the end of the chapter and just be able to recognize those um, and, and what their effects would be. So looking at the effects of exercise, so again, regular aerobic exercise. So again, on, on top of just all the other, you know, health, you know, health metrics that, that improve, specifically when we look at hypertension, um, again, regular aerobic exercise can just improve your VO2 max, your cardiovascular efficiency, and actually cause a decrease in systolic and diastolic pressure. And you can see here, um, the, the decreases you can get, which again is, is pretty impactful. You know, on top of other things, obviously like weight loss and everything, if that's, you know, something that's contributing to the hypertension, potentially we can, we can look to decrease that as well. Resistance training actually can cause a decrease as well. So you can get about a three or four millimeter mercury uh, decrease in both systolic and diastolic uh, blood pressure. And again, any resulting weight loss, if, if that's an, an issue, can have a positive effect on blood pressure as well. So again, with, with exercise, you also get decreased or reduced catecholamine activity and also an increase in vasodilation. So the increased vasodilation that you get as a result of exercise and the reduced um, catecholamine activity, so your catecholamines are, are hormones that are responsible for that flight or fight sympathetic response. Um, you also get a decreased effect of those um, as a result. And again, that's going to have a, a beneficial effect on the uh, reduction in blood pressure. So looking at your exercise recommendations, again, the recommendations are summarized in your, your tables, but here are some, some points to just kind of stand out. So in kind of looking at it again, everything again should be individualized, like we say with a lot of conditions, but there are certain things that are, are, are pretty beneficial for just about everybody um, that would, would be diagnosed with this. So again, you know, at least 30 minutes of aerobic exercise daily, um, and then you have your intensity measurements here. Again, you also have to consider if their heart rate is gonna be affected by medication. So you have to, if you're using heart rate reserve, um, ideally you're looking at someone that's not taking a medication that 
is going to affect their heart rate. So that's why I say make sure, you know, and, and for testing purposes and everything, make sure you're aware of the classes of, of hypertension drugs and what their mechanism is for controlling it. Uh, since blood pressure is reduced after exercise for about four hours, multiple shorter bouts are more advantageous. You know, I had mentioned previously, um, I don't remember when I talked about it, but I had brought up how, you know, even going for, you know, instead of going for one, you know, one 30 minute or one 40 minute walk a day, you know, do multiple shorter walks in a day for your, if you're doing that for your aerobic activity. Um, and, and there's actual benefits beyond even just looking at, you know, blood pressure. And, and I don't remember if I mentioned it in regards to this, but like, again, controlling blood sugar is something really good about, you know, taking multiple walks over the course of the day. Um, you have your resistance training, again, two to three days a week, again, moderate intensity, we see this moderate intensity range uh, very commonly throughout, again, because it's kind of a safe starting point for most people. You can do a lower intensity um, and higher volume circuit workout. That may be more appropriate as well. So you can actually do, um, you know, strength training, but almost kind of also working on the, their aerobic abilities with it can, can be beneficial as well. And again, you should always cease exercise if blood pressure uh, exceeds for a systolic 220 or a 105 diastolic. So that would be where you would want to cease exercise. So again, you know, if, if you know, if an individual is monitoring their blood pressure, those would be the points where exercise would be discontinued. Okay, peripheral artery disease. So peripheral artery disease is a narrowing of the non-cardiac arteries that results in a reduction of blood flow. So we're looking at the arteries in the periphery. So, so coronary artery disease would be looking at narrowing in the, the, the coronary arteries in the, in the heart. Here we're looking at the, the arteries in the periphery. So uh, same idea, just affecting a different area. Um, the hallmark of this is what's called intermittent claudication, which is pain in the legs in conjunction with physical activity that occurs due to insufficient blood flow. So obviously, if these arteries are being narrowed, you're not getting as much blood flow. The, the muscles aren't going to be getting, in, you know, in the lower extremity, aren't going to be getting as much uh, oxygen perfused to them. You're starting to get that, that intermittent pain cramping sensation. And you're also going to notice that the claudication is going to be relieved at rest. Um, so that will be kind of a hallmark of the, the start of the development of, of peripheral artery disease. Like um, coronary artery disease, again, peripheral um, arterial disease is going to be the result of plaque buildup in the peripheral arteries. So you're going to be getting atherosclerosis of um, the arteries in the periphery and many of the same risk factors that we'll, we'll be talking about with uh, coronary artery disease. You see the same thing with peripheral arterial disease. So your medications that you're gonna be looking at, again, various types uh, of medications, blood thinners, antiplatelet, vasoactive agents, statins to reduce cholesterol, and medications for hypertension are gonna be the most commonly prescribed medications. So again, you're looking at what are some of the other issues that the person's dealing with. Again, if you know, you're dealing with somebody with dyslipidemia, somebody with hypertension, you know, those, those medications would be prescribed accordingly. Again, so other disease states are also likely to be present. So typically you're gonna be looking at some other um, condition being present, which will also have to be considered as well. Now, most of the, the medications will have little or no effect on exercise, except the ones that are gonna directly affect heart rate. Um, so again, you're gonna have those that directly affect heart rate. Um, you know, for instance, you do have to, you know, just as one example, again, look to see some other situations where this would be the place. But for instance, statins, you know, one of the side effects of statins is uh, muscle pain. So that could be something that would also possibly affect your, your resistance training. Um, but, but typically the big ones would be the ones that would affect heart rate. Um, some vasoactive agents may actually increase exercise capacity. So if, if you're looking at a medication that's going to impact uh, the blood vessels uh, from a vasodilation standpoint, 
those could potentially actually increase one's uh, exercise capacity, but most of the medications um, will, will typically have a, a neutral impact or, or not really impact um, exercise capacity either way. So looking at peripheral arterial disease, if we look at the effects of exercise. So when we're looking at exercise with individuals with this condition, we obviously have to look at whether or not they have intermittent claudication. So the claudication is going to dictate the exercise intensity, meaning that, um, you know, obviously there's going to reach a point with individuals with their activity where the discomfort from the claudication is going to, to kind of be a limit as far as what they can do intensity wise. Um, so th what, what this basically is gonna do is gonna kind of keep their exercise, typic their, their, their intensities typically a little bit lower, which obviously then that could limit some of the, the beneficial effects, obviously ba based on intensity. Um, one thing we do know that individuals with peripheral arterial disease, they do get improved cardiovascular efficiency just as anybody would. So just the general effects, when we look at exercise, you get improved cardiovascular efficiency. And again, you're gonna get lower blood pressures and, and heart rates at a given workload. Um, with training, individuals will gradually be able to increase the intensity at which claudication appears. So this is something, so an individual who does have the intermittent claudication over time, we'll be able to increase the intensity. So that is something to note. So when you're, when you're looking at an individual that has the intermittent claudication with their peripheral arterial disease, um, they will gradually, if they continue, they will be able to get effects from greater and greater intensities because the, the intensity where the claudication appears is going to kind of be pushed off. And that's going to be due to you know, increased blood flow to the legs, you know, you're going to get reduced tone of the vessels, decreased blood viscosity, and you're also going to get a greater shift from anaerobic to aerobic metabolism. So in other words, they're going to be using more of their aerobic metabolism as time goes on, which will, which will again limit some of the, um, the negative effects from the, the intermittent claudication as well. So in looking at exercise recommendations, again, review your tables, table 6.3 and table 6.4. I'm gonna mention some other um, particulars as it relates to exercise recommendations. In general though, as with a lot of things, it's important to perform testing. So we look at you know specifically why we'd wanna do testing for these individuals. A any client with a known cardiovascular disease, whether it's peripheral arterial disease or anything else, they should obtain medical clearance prior to an exercise program, obviously. Um, and again, individuals with peripheral arterial disease, regardless of their symptom severity, should undergo exercise testing because part of the thing is you can identify the level of exercise that results in symptoms. Um, you could also kind of establish post-exercise ankle pressures, which would be important for the intermittent claudication and just kind of give you some you know, baseline information that can be gathered. So in other words, your textbook talks about, for instance, you know, you can note their total walking distance before they start to have pain, particularly if that hasn't been previously established. So, um, and again, the, even the possibility of other cardiovascular disease that, that may not have been determined or found could also kind of be um, looked at as well with a lot of the exercise testing. So one of the things when we look at, um, so again, once we kind of have our exercise testing done, we can kind of then, you know, come up with the, the different parameters. So walking is probably one of the best things that individuals with this condition could do just because of the greater use of the gastrocnemius muscle. So weight walking or other types of weight bearing exercise, really important. Um, they, they talk about the recommended intensities um, in the book. Here we have the intensity looking at about 40 to a little less than 60% of the heart rate reserve or a claudication pain level of three out of four. So they recommend that if they do start to have pain, um, rest until the pain subsides, working till about 30 minutes of exercise can be sustained without rest. That's essentially what you're, you're really looking to do. Um, 
And then again, the guidelines for resistance training are similar to other clients with uh, coronary artery disease. So again, two to three days a week, that moderate intensity, 60 to 80%, 10 to 12 reps, one to two sets. Again, use large multi-joint exercises and, you know, look at your progressions. You know, one thing to note, um, we haven't talked a ton about progressions, but typically when you look at, you know, larger upper body movements, you know, two to five pound increases for upper body exercises and five to 10 for lower body, you can just, you tend to be able to increase the, the progression a little bit faster with lower body exercises, just because the muscle groups are, are larger. Okay, another condition we look at here is angina. So angina is a pain in the chest, neck, arm, jaw, back uh, that results due to ischemia in the heart tissue. So ischemia is a decrease um, in, in blood flow, which obviously is going to um, affect oxygen levels. It's usually going to be the result of a narrowed coronary artery from an atherosclerotic plaque. Um, and it can be brought on specifically by either physical, physical exertion, stress, or vasospasm. Now, there's two different types we look at. So you have stable angina, which again, with stable angina, you have a specific onset of a level of stress. Um, you know, it, for instance, with physical activity that is rapidly alleviated with rest or nitroglycerin. So that would be your stable angina, whereas your unstable is a little less predictable and it could actually also occur at rest. So there you have your basic, your, your two different types. Um, so again, typically what you have is the level of exertion at which angina occurs is predictable and reproducible. And that would be, again, your stable angina. Again, whereas with the unstable, as we had talked about, it's far less predictable and, and sometimes could even occur to an individual at rest. So as far as your medications, um, some various medications that get used. So again, kind of look at um, as, I, as I just, you know, kind of encourage periodically, but you should really be doing this all the time, look at how the medications, because again, you're going to be seeing medications that get used for various purposes. So again, knowing the effects, you could kind of understand how they would be used to help treat it. So nitrates, calcium channel blockers, and beta blockers are all used to treat angina. Um, again, they have the effect of reducing myocardial um, oxygen demand and increasing functional capacity in individuals that have it. Um, one thing to note, particularly when you're talking about vasoactive drugs, they may cause dizziness, syncope, you know, particularly with changes in posture. So you want to make sure to take precautions just to prevent falls um, in individuals due to the, the dizziness from taking these. So particularly with the vasoactive, so the vasoactive drugs basically work as vasodilating agents. And that's part of the reason why um, individuals can, you know, that it could possibly change, cause dizziness and syncope, particularly with posture because of the, the issues with um, blood pressure with the, due to the vasodilation. So that's an important one to look at, but look at the other effects from some of these and, and be able to understand kind of how that's going to impact um, individuals who have, uh, who have angina. So looking at the effects of exercise, again, regular workload is going to help increase the efficiency of the heart. And it's also going to increase the tolerable workload. Um, and obviously again, some of the secondary benefits like decreased body weight, which will obviously help for, for general overall health. The primary goal of exercise programming for a client with this is to be to increase the amount of work that can be that can be performed before that ischemic threshold is reached. So the chest pain is obviously going to be the limiting factor. And if we know what that ex ischemic threshold is, that kind of then becomes your goal to, again, increase the amount that you can do before that actually happens. So you're going to be gradually looking to, to build up to that point. Um, and again, this is going to vary. So, you know, the initial amount of exercise that they can tolerate is going to be a function of, you know, the size of the lesions that they have that are, that are causing the, the angina and also the amount of uh, collateral blood flow available to the, to the heart tissue. So your exercise recommendations are, are summarized in 6.5 and 6.6. 6. 
So, uh, you know, again, following medical release again and graded exercise tests, you know, again, you know, large muscle group activities, walking, jogging, cycling, four to seven days per week, 20 to 60 minutes of intermittent or continuous exercise. And what you want to do is keep it an in intensity 10 to 15 beats per minute below the threshold for the, the angina. So, you know, a heart rate monitor could certainly be very, very helpful in kind of determining that. As far as the resistance training, um, two to three times per week, um, the, the intensity they recommend is a little bit lower. And again, the um, intensity is determined by the, the an, angina symptoms again, but they do recommend a, a little lower intensity at about 40 to 60%. Uh, longer than normal warm up and cool down are suggested. Um, and again, if, if the symptoms appear, Intensity should be lowered, nitrate should be taken if necessary. If, if the symptoms persist or the chest pain does not kind of abate, if it does come about, you know, in the, in the midst of a, of, a, of a session or a workout, you know, obviously then the, the, the client should be um, taken to the, to the emergency room.